Hi, I'm Sheila Kolhakar. I'm a staff writer with The New Yorker, and I'm a former hedge fund analyst. So I have followed Sally's career for many years. She was, uh, for at least seven or eight years, the most prominent woman in the financial world on the cover of Fortune magazine. She was well known for her integrity and honesty in a business that was not known for those things, to put it mildly. And she, she rose up as an analyst at Sanford Bernstein. She then joined the senior management team at Citigroup, became the CFO of Citigroup during a really interesting time before leading up to the financial crisis. She left Citigroup, I use quotes because I'm going to ask you about that later, and uh, then was at Merrill Lynch and since then has become a technology entrepreneur trying to close the um, gender investing gap, which is a real thing, apparently. So what I'm hoping to do is, um, you know, she's not a typical tech CEO in any sense of the word, and, and I'm hoping to kind of talk through her career, which has been really interesting, and talk about how that all led up to what you're doing now. So let's start by, you know, please explain to us what Elevest is. Yeah. Sheila, thank you for having me. Oh, hello. <laughs> it's quite loud. Yep. Uh, Elevest is a digital investment platform for women. Uh, some of you might call it a robo-advisor. Uh, some of you might be thinking, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Uh, why in the world would women need their own investing platform? Is it pink? Is it remedial financial education? Do we talk about our feelings? Is it dumbed down? All of these gen inherent gender biases may be floating around in your head, and they might be floating around in your head if you've spent time on Wall Street, which has had numerous initiatives for women over the years, which have involved messages along the lines of don't buy the shoes, invest in the stock market instead. And it came, to, you know, I had an insight a handful of a couple of years ago now that women don't invest to the same extent that men do. It's not something we talk about. We talk about the gender pay gap, but there is a gender investing gap. It costs some women more than the gender pay gap. It costs many women tens of thousands, many women hundreds of thousands, some women millions of dollars versus men over the course of their careers. And the industry that I grew up in, where the financial advisors are 85 to 87 percent male, where we love, there's not a war analogy or sports analogy we ever met that we didn't love, where the symbol of the industry is a bull, a phallic symbol, <laughs> that that was an industry that was really doing a much better job of serving men than women, and so building something for women to attack this gender investing gap that isn't a perception of what women look for, but really based on hundreds and hundreds of hours of research with them of what keeps you from investing and what are you looking for, that is Elevest. I definitely noticed that there was no um, leopard print pump on the logo of no. the company, which was a change. There is so not. that was interesting. So when we spoke about this a few months ago, just as you were kind of launching, you told me a story about your, you know, your personal history and your first marriage and how you had learned <laughs> some really important lessons about how crucial it is for women to learn to manage money, and this is not traditionally how it works. Typically, in a lot of households, uh, you know, the men handle the finances, or at least that used to be the model, and the women would just sign when they were asked to sign, and they didn't necessarily ask, but that is... That is Traditional yeah. gender roles. I mean, yeah. money, and, 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 and I wouldn't say money so much as really investing in particular, Still, we buy, men and women buy the 1958 Ozzie and Harriet, this is how it should be, and, and some of the myths, right? Men are, boys are better at math than girls. Well, that's not true. The research is clear. That men are better investors than women. Well, that's not true either. Women are as good or better hedge fund managers, mutual fund managers, individual investors that women are too risk averse to invest. That one people buy, it's somehow, you know, the uterus will somehow <laughs> keep you from investing in some way. That pesky uterus. That we yeah. women need, I hear this all the time, I thought this, we need, what we really need is the hand holding to invest, which is a little patronizing. And also that we need more financial education to invest, which we all buy into, and particularly us women, because I don't, 
I don't know, didn't you love getting an A at school? It was like my whole thing. And so we want more, as soon as I get more financial education, then I'll invest. But men need more financial education too. And they do, and we don't. And again, if you don't like big numbers, you know, it costs us hundreds of thousands or millions, maybe, you, maybe you'll be startled by little numbers, which is if a woman makes $85,000 a year, puts aside 20% of it in the bank, doesn't invest for 10 years, which we see all the time because I'm going to get educated on it, it costs her on average $100 a day over that period of time. So the numbers are dramatic, but we just accept the Ozzy Harriet thing. And I know you want me to bring up my first husband. And yes, he managed their money, and I let him. And then when he's now my ex-husband, and he's with my ex-friend, and you know, <laughs> when that whole thing happened, I know it was a little shy. I mean, I'm it sorry, was tough. Yeah. And like for so, you know, 50% of marriages end in divorce. You guys die sooner than we do. So 90% of women, even in a traditional environment, have to manage their money on their own at some point in their lives, and we're left unprepared. So, so since leaving Wall Street, you've been, you've been very outspoken. You've been very um, adept at using social media to express some very strong opinions about your old industry. So you've described it as a boys' club. So, so can you tell us why? Well, I mean, because it is. And, and again, I lo look, this, I have nothing against middle-aged white guys. I've been married to a couple of them. I think they're <laughs> amazing individuals amazing individuals, but the, and uh, when I was running Merrill, when I was running Smith Barney, it was 85 to 87 percent of the financial advisors were white gentlemen. The age has been creeping up. I talked to the head of one brokerage firm a handful of months ago, and he told me that he has more financial advisors over the age of 80 than under the age of 30. And so these numbers are on average in their 60s today. So it is. It's a, it's a man's club, and even when we think in an industry that we're talking to women, if 87% of you are men, you're, you're talking to men. I mean, just you, you default to it. Well, so obviously we've seen a lot of herd-type behavior and, and the financial crisis when you're at one of your sort of most powerful positions. There was a lot of groupthink, and of course we realized that a lot of these very male-dominated Wall Street firms had not made good decisions, not... Done, done proper risk analysis. So what was your view? I mean, and then you, then you yeah. left. So I was wondering if you could explain yeah. why you left Citigroup at that yeah. time, 2007. So I was fired. Um, <laughs> so, so let's go there. Um, <laughs> she, I knew you were going there. I'm she sorry. Was. They, know, they tell cool. the lawyers no, tell fine. us not to use the word fired. So no, I was fired. I mean, and yeah. I, I was <laughs> kicked out on my, you know what? Yeah, I will never. There are some days you'll never forget, and I will never forget sitting in my office one day and turning around and seeing on CNBC my face telling, and the, the ticker coming across that I, was, I had been fired. I'm like, I did not know that. <laughs> so good to know. Look at this. So here, here's, so here's the deal. Um, I was, I'm going to shock you all right now, um, and then I'm going to explain it. I was fired because I was a woman. <gasps> she just went there. Oh she boy. just went there. Here's Vikram the story. Vikram Pandit, are you listening? Um, I was the only woman on the senior leadership team of City. I was running Smith Barney. We had sold, going into the crisis, um, financial, financial products to our clients that we truly believed were low risk, that we truly believed would go down about eight cents on the dollar in a bad market, but mistakes were made. We were dumb about it, and there's a bad market, and it went down 100 cents on the dollar. So the big print said low risk, the little print said you could lose everything. I went through this, I, I, where's the evil doer? Where's the evil doer? Who's, you know, who did this to try to make extra money? And what I found was that people I worked with, good people, it was just mistakes. So I went to my very brand new boss, who I knew very not well at all, and said, I think, I, should, I think we should partially reimburse our clients. I think it's the right thing to do ethically. I think it's the best thing for the relationship, and I think it's the best thing for the company long term. I tell you I say this to my, my boss, but I didn't because he wouldn't see me, and so he sort of had his squad tell me no. And I kept thinking maybe they hadn't understood, and maybe they didn't get it, and I did new analyses, and we went back and forth and back and forth. He kept, they kept saying no, and eventually went to the board. The board 
some of whom had invested in it, asked for us to debate it with them. And if you want to talk about a long day in your life, it's the day you go to debate your boss in front of the board. Um, and I won the battle. We partially reimbursed clients. And of course, he fired me for it. Um, which, you know, and by the way, now every once in a while, I, about four months ago, I was on a plane. And by the way, they fired me, paid me nothing, even though the press reported they did, like out on my, my bottom. And I was on a plane a few months ago, and I ran into one of the former members of the board. Oh, and, uh, and he said, you know, really sorry about that getting fired thing. <laughs> You know, but you were brave. You did the right thing. I'm like, well, okay, I guess that's better than a sharp stick in the eye, but only by not that much. So, you know, now, wh what? wait, you said you got fired because you're a woman. I believe I got fired because I was different. And I was the only woman on that team. I was one of very few women on Wall Street. And as I've looked at the research over time, in fact, I have a book coming out in January that, that, run, that goes through some of this, we women, not better, not worse than guys, but on average, their different um, characteristics tend to be very relationship focused, tend to be quite long-term focused. And those were the qualities I was feeling as we were going through this. And as I said, I was the only one on Wall Street that did it. Um, to your point, I do believe groupthink was a big driver of the downturn, a big driver. Um, and that groupthink is broken by diversity, and Wall Street has become less diverse, not more diverse, since the crisis. So, so you left. You were fired, as you put it. So what is the first thing you did after that I happened? I drank. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> what, what was your poison? Wine? I'll, I'll take an oaky Chardonnay. I'm from the South, <laughs> so I do the soror, you know, the okay. sort of, you, you know, girl, UNC. I'll take a Chardonnay, please. <laughs> Yeah. So you were in a drunken stupor yeah, for, for how many days? Okay. And then I had a, I had a, inter, a global day of um, mourning for Sally and feeling sorry for Sally, a day of sympathy for Sally. Well, and it's very hard to go through that in such a public fashion. So that yes and been, no. Yeah. Um, yes and no. It, it it wasn't fun. That being said, I find so many particularly so females. The research shows take failure harder than men do. And I find so many of my friends who get fired then end up spending all this time telling, you know, sort of apologizing for it, talking about why they weren't really fired. And, and at least it was Band-Aid ripped off. This just happened in front of everybody I know plus everybody I don't know. So that was cool. So, so after you recovered from this yeah. a little bit, um, got sober, I'm sure, after. So, so you went back in, though. You went, you, you probably did not need to rush out and seek out another yeah. paycheck, but you did take another Wall Street job yeah. at Merrill Lynch. So, so tell us how that went. So, you know, <laughs> then I got a call from Ken Lewis. He said, we bought Merrill Lynch at Bank of America. Um, Sandy Weil, who's my old boss, says, you're the one who can turn it around. Come on in. And I thought, score. Like, I'm back in. And this is even better because the attrition rate at Merrill was about 50%, 50 plus percent. So people were streaming out of there. It was a mess. Okay, and it's bigger than Smith Barney. So this is, I'm gonna just, watch me. This is gonna be amazing, I'm going in. And so I did. <laughs> uh, okay, so what had you hoped to accomplish there? What so, was your goal? Yeah. Okay. So then, hold on, I forgot the other good part of the story. So then Ken Lewis <laughs> says to me, it's a really tough place, this place is tough, but you've got my word, I'm gonna be here for two years, my word, and then my best bud, who's my number two, is gonna be here for another two years, so we got you covered, because you're gonna have to take some action, it's gonna be tough. I said, good, thank you. So you were like the cleanup person. Yes, you were I, well, I'm the, the turnaround girl yep. again. I'm, your, I'm the turnaround girl, so I go in, and he, so he's supposed to be there for two years. He announces his retirement less than two months later. I'm like, oh, man. And just for organizational dynamics, I knew I was in trouble when nobody called me, right? When his, his retirement was announced and I didn't get a call from anybody. So I went to the new boss and I said, look, you, you didn't ask me to be here. I'm not, you know, you, I, you didn't choose me for your team. I'll leave. And he said, nope, this thing needs to be turned around. Please stay. So I stayed, put in place really an amazing team at Merrill. And in two, two years later, we had got the attrition rate from 50% to single digit. The business was growing. We were beating plan. You know, it was, it was amazing. 
And you left. And then I got fired. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> um, again. Uh, I'm sorry. I know. So, yeah, that's I know. annoying. Um, so, uh, and so I drank. You drank again. Okay. Yeah, that happened. Okay. Good. You good. know, it's one thing. Like it was. You're like, oh, come on. You know, it's one thing you go up against your boss. You're like, all right, that's just going to happen. It's another thing when, particularly as a female, I don't think I've ever talked about this. You know, we have this view, and I knew I'm not a dumb woman. I knew I wasn't in the inner circle. You know, the CEO wasn't calling me, hey, Sally, let's bat some ideas around. Can I swing by your office? I mean, I got it. But I kept telling my team, if we beat plan, we do it the right way, we grow the business, we gain share, keep our noses clean, ethical, we're going to be great. And then I got reorged out. And you're like, oh, that's not, I didn't think that was how it was supposed to work. You clearly didn't learn the lesson about not presenting an opposing view to the boss, I guess. Is that, is that well, what I, I, I wasn't not, I mean, I, I mean, I'd oppose, I'd give them, I'd debate with them. I mean, I wasn't being the good girl, but I just thought you just do it right, it works out. So anyway, so then I got, so that happened. And other people got reorged out on the same day as my sister said they should send me a thank you note because it was Sally Krawcheck and some other people, you know, were fired. <laughs> and so I went home and drank and, and, the, and so that was a day. And then the really lesson I learned from that was I called the board afterwards. I called the whole board two days after and I said two messages, I mean those who would call me back, which wasn't all of them naturally. And I said two messages. One, I want to thank you for the opportunity to run Merrill Lynch as an American icon. You know, what, a, what an amazing honor. And number two, what could I have done better? And they said there was nobody in there fighting for you. That even with the, you know, the results are ahead of plan and so on, the, the, the word was, well, imagine how much better they could be if we had somebody better as opposed to, hey, why don't we fire, why don't we get rid of somebody who's missing plan? Yeah, whatever. What are you going to do? Politics. What are you going to yeah. do? So, so this was a really interesting moment. I mean, the, the economy was sort of reeling from the financial crisis. There was all this sort of analysis going on about how did all these banks take all this risk? Why didn't anyone contemplate the housing market collapsing? No one had even considered it might happen. So how did you go from that moment and the drinking to deciding you wanted to start your own company? Because, well, first of all, it sort of felt like karma. And I know karma is busy doing other things and sending me signals. But, you know, two in a row when you're, ru when you're running businesses the right way and, beat and meeting and beating plan, you, you have to at some point say, there, I think there's another path for me here. And really, and, and I spend a lot of time, what matters to me? So is it these big companies? Does big company matter? Does big office matter? What matters? And my conclusion is impact matters. Because for all of this, I, I'm the most fortunate person I know. I cannot believe I got to do these jobs. And I fully recognize that my worst day, those days I was fired, are better than s most of the world's best day. So I get it. And so I said, okay, so this time it's about impact. And the way I got to Elevest was not now I want to be an entrepreneur, but rather one morning I had the insight that the retirement, putting on mascara, of course, that the retirement savings crisis is actually a female crisis. And that women live six to eight years longer than men. We're 80 to 85% of nursing home residents. And we, may, and we retire with two thirds the money of men. Some of it because we make less, some of it because we work fewer years, but some of it because we don't invest as much. If we fix those things, we not only solve in good part the retirement crisis, but we grow the economy at the same time, which is really amazing, because you don't think of solving that and growing the economy. And the one that I could have impact on was the gender investing gap. As one of the few senior women on Wall Street and one who was willing to take a risk, I could. Now, for, you know, but first I, I went, I went to all sort of the senior guys at the big banks and said, I'm not an entrepreneur, why don't you do this? And, and got a lot back of, um, well, don't their husbands manage their money for them? Uh, and so said, well, you know what? If you want to change something, you got to change it yourself. And so it wasn't I wanted to be an entrepreneur. It's that I want to make an impact. And this, I think, now more than ever, I think you can have more impact as an entrepreneur than you can at a big company these days. 
So what is the first thing you did? Did you think about, so you, so you thought to yourself, I'm going to tackle this problem. Did you decide you were going to build an app? Did you design an algorithm? Did you look for a quant to help you? I mean, how yeah. do you, what's the first yeah. thing you do? Um, the first thing I did, so a number of these that start tend to start um, with the technology first, which is important, but the finance also has to be first. And I knew that we needed to make real changes in how we engaged with women. Otherwise, why isn't, you know, it's not working already. So I took a year to find a chief investment officer who had enough experience, but enough creativity that the two of us could work together and bring out a product that was different enough based, really co-creating it with women um, so that it would appeal to women. So it was doing that um, and then finding a co-founder who had a financial technology background since I don't and finding a lead designer who had helped lead the redesign of Vogue.com so that we have a site women felt comfortable with, finding a product manager who came from Weight Watchers so we know something about women and behavior change, but nobody I'd worked with in my prior job, but individuals who came from very different backgrounds because I can't talk the diversity talk around gender on Wall Street and then leave it behind and just have some of my squad try to fix this, but really, who are those people we can find that come at it in such different ways that we can build something that no one's seen before? Was it hard to get people to understand what you're trying to do? Was that, was that a long conversation, yeah. or did people get it immediately? Uh, I think it depends on the person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, the, you know, I t sat down with one CTO, and he's like, no, no, <laughs> no, no, not, don't, no, no. Um, I sat down with one individual, and she says she had chills, that the idea that her grandmother had suffered financially in the course of her life, and that the idea of being able to spend her life to do something to help other women, she, I mean, she said, just, just sign me up to it. So I think it depends on the person, but it's a very, it's a business, make no mistake, but it's as mission-driven an undertaking as it exists out there today, you know, in a commercial form. So, um what are some of the scenarios? So it sounds like you did a lot of research into, into your sort of potential client base. What are some of the scenarios that most commonly come up where women, you know, this weakness becomes sort of prominent? I mean, it seems like women outlive their spouses if they're married often. Yeah. So, divorce. you know, it, yeah. as we mentioned, ha you know, whether it's half a marriage is ending divorce or some, some bit, you know, double digit percent, um, women outlive their, their spouses. Women say that they talk to financial advisors, and I've actually done the through the glass observation. Financial, male financial advisors believe they spend about 55% of the time talking to the male, 45 to the female, but it's about 90-10. And so as a result, in the year after their husband's death, women leave that financial advisor at a rate of greater than 70%. And so what we've built is something that doesn't go into her and say, hey, would you like a large cap growth mutual fund or a small cap growth ETF, but fundamentally rethinks it. We get information from her. We ask her what she wants to achieve in life. Buy a home, start a business, retire well, have a kid. Very concrete things. With a very powerful algorithm, we have four patents pending. We calculate what she can afford, when she can afford it, by investing and by depositing parts of her, you know, some portion of her salary. She makes trade-offs. You know what? I'll retire at 67 so I can have the baby sooner. I'll have a smaller house so I can start the business, start the business, whatever those things. She makes the trade-offs. And we provide her not a fund that is going to outperform the S&P because who gives a you-know-what, but instead a highly bespoke investment portfolio customized to each individual goal. So she'll have an emergency fund goal that's cash. She'll have a fund goal that will be to buy a home that'll be more bonds because it's in six years, call it. And the retirement will be more equities. We do all that for her as a fiduciary. She doesn't have to choose. We target getting her to her goal in 70% of markets or better. So on average, she should do better than what we, what we target her to. And here's the, the part that tested best. If she falls off track, we tell her she's off track. The market cracked more than we thought. You didn't deposit the $1,000, you whatever. Um, and here's what to do to get back on track. 
very different from, oh, when the yen outperformed the euro today, and so therefore, that's all cru that's all stuff in the middle, right? That's all stuff. What she wants, what she tells us is, I'm here, I want to get there. I will trust you to get me there, but I don't want to have to watch the shows on TV, CNBC and Bloomberg and some of these, to do the six steps in between to get there. I want you to do it. So very different from anything else that's out there right now. So how do you guys make money? Do you we charge basis points on assets, so mm -hmm. half a percentage point, which, you know, for a full financial plan, the most, cut to my mind, the most customized investment plan out there, and tell you if you're <laughs> off track, if it's 50,000 bucks that we manage for, it's less than a dollar a day. Not bad. And so what has fundraising been like? I, I mean, there's been some publicity around oh, your so investors. Oh, so this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. So we ra the first round we raised was... $10 million, Morningstar was our lead investor, and, and financial folks, Mohamed El Aryan, um, Ajay Banga, who's the CEO of MasterCard, um, uh, Brian Finn, who's the former president of Credit Suisse. So a group of financially oriented individuals. This next round was so amazing. So we raised $9 million. It's a convertible note. We have a, a Silicon Valley venture firm, Kosla, who's one of our investors. Um, but what happened this time is that we had some really unbelievable, very successful women say, we want to be part of this. This isn't just a company, this is a movement, right? To make women out there aware of this gap and to give them a means in their control to close this gap. And so Venus Williams, Melody Hobson, who's the president of Ariel Capital, Miriam Rivera, who was the co-general counsel of, of Google, some amazing female venture capitalists from the West Coast, Teresa Gao, Jennifer Fonstadt, um, Sonia Perkins. And what was so fun about it was if you think FinTech company raises convertible, okay, I have a picture in my mind, male, male, male. But what it was is, can I say the word badass? I think Crazy so. Crazy successful <laughs> badass women invest in a company fintech company, built by women, run by women, conceived of by women, for women to help them invest. And so what I'm hoping is, this is the beginning not only of, of making individuals aware of this important gap, but what I really love is this sense of women coming together. And we've, we've come together, we've supported each other for a long time, uh, but as women become more financially strong, right, investing in each other. So we're, we're going to have to wrap up in a moment, but before we go, I'd like to... So, so there are a lot of similarities between Silicon Valley and Wall Street. Uh, you know, I, the, it's very male-dominated. There's, there's some questions about how well a lot of venture capital investors are considering risk, and, you know, Blue Apron is worth $3 billion, supposedly. So, what, I mean, what do you see when you look at those two worlds? Because now you're sort of standing in between them. How are they different? How are they similar? Sometimes I call my female friends in Silicon Valley, something will happen, right? There'll be a, a gender discrimination case. And I say, you're almost trying to make Wall Street look good, you know, with the gender thing. But certainly neither in any way reflects the population of this country. And the challenge is not just that it's not fair and it's not right, and the country has been built on a sense of, if, you know, equality of opportunity, but that you just miss so much. So my business... My business, when I took it to, I've taken it to a few senior venture capitalists, when I took it to CEOs of some of the big banks, because I, like, I'm not an entrepreneur. It was no, 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 women don't, women don't, women don't, right? It's like, guys, women control $5 trillion of investable assets. We jointly control with our spouses another six. I mean, this is a huge market that you're dismissing as a niche market because you haven't figured out a way to serve it. And it's and because and therefore it is a niche market for you, and so I just think they're going to miss it. And you know what? I think if we wait for it to change, we're going to be waiting until we're dead at some point. And that's why I, that's what I loved about our funding, which is the first of all, I think what's amazing, the cost of starting businesses is coming down. So I'm not sure that CEOs at big companies will all of a sudden increase their diversity. 
If they don't, women can leave now and start our own businesses. And no, the venture capitalists won't get it at the big levels, but we're doing so well in the crowdfunding, and if we can begin to use our resources to fund each other, I think, I think it can be very big without waiting for, geez, is that dude going to get it or is that dude going to get it? And that we have, as women, more power than we recognize. And that as we begin to step into it, I think it's great for everybody in this room, great for the economy, and great for society. Well, thank you very much for being thank here. You. Thank, yeah. you. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.